And she's cutting all the bread up and she's slapping meat on the bread and buttering it up and doing this and then wrapping them up. And, and her mom said, Dorothy, what are you doing? And she said, Mom, every week the wagon comes with the rag pickers. And we have never given, we have never fed them. And she said, I'm just making sandwiches. When, when they come this afternoon, I'm going to go out and give them all sandwiches. And her mother said, how right you are, Dorothy. Thank you. They understood what Eucharist really was. Um, and, and Dorothy herself, even, they, even her, her siblings today will say she was the leader in the family. She was kind of in the middle of the group, but she was the, she was a small person, but she was always the one leading out front. Now, one of the perspectives about a Catholic understanding of Eucharist, and of course this is, it's, this is not the only approach to Eucharist that Roman Catholics would take, but it is a central one for us because this is going to be grounded in the Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy coming out of Vatican Council II, which was the revolutionary document that pushed the Catholic Church to renew the liturgy, to, to restore it to becoming a more life-giving and authentic ritual celebration of what we understood to be the life of Christ given to us through his history and through the scriptures. Many, you know this from your own studies. For us Catholics, one of the predominant things that happened at that time was that the scriptures were given back to us. I mean, we not only were not studying scripture, my parents, the generation ahead of me, were told not to read scripture. Because at that time, the Roman Catholic Church was nervous. You might read it and interpret it. And who knows what would happen if you started interpreting this. So we didn't. I mean, we had Bibles in our homes, but we just didn't, you never opened up and read it. So Vatican Council II said that that's a terrible mistake in our tradition, and we are learning from our non-Catholic Christian brothers and sisters the scripture is central and needs to be returned to the people. So our mass, we began incorporating. That's when we developed the current lectionary that we use and began using many more readings at, at mass on a regular basis, beginning serious Bible study with everyone. Now what happens with Dorothy, when Dorothy goes to Brazil, having done, she taught in Chicago, then she taught in Arizona for a while, worked with migrant workers in Arizona, but eventually, the invitation to go to Brazil comes, and she's the first one to put her name down. When, when um, the request was come to Brazil, she went, I'm going to go. So, and one of their main works was to gather people together, small groups in, in these uh, small Christian communities, and really read and pray with scripture. Now, I want you to imagine, in the regions of Brazil where Dorothy was working, she says, before she's in the Amazon, she's in a, a large city area, these are the most, the poorest of the poor, who have never studied scripture because they, they do not have Bibles. And so, with the leadership of the church there, they were printing, they would print a gospel up and sell it for a nickel. Now, why sell it for a nickel? Because of the pride of the people in buying it. I have purchased my gospel of St. Matthew, but a nickel. Now, I'm, I'm diverging a little bit here, this is, this is parallel. This, uh, Dorothy's up in the state of Pará, which is northwestern Brazil, down in Sao Paulo, which is south. The Catholic Church was doing the same thing with scripture, and I think what they did was wonderful, because they had a cardinal there who really was like on board. He said, we're taking Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, printing them up separately, red, blue, green, yellow. Because we can't even say to the people, bring in the Gospel of Matthew. They don't know what we mean. We can say, bring the red book. It made sense. And, and as the scripture was then implemented in the renewal of our liturgy, that cardinal said to his priest, in the year that we do the Gospel of Matthew, red book, Tell the people to bring the Red Book to Mass every week. And for right now, we want them to follow along. So when you get to the Gospel, you're going to say, open your Red Book to page 32. 
<laughs> because then they would get it. And, and he did that for four or five years until the people, oh, now we're really understanding. What a, it's a brilliant pedagogical move. Now, Dorothy's doing the same thing up north. In the small base communities, they're just gathering a group, and for the first time, they're sitting, and they're reading a passage from scripture. They would read, for example, and I'll use the one, Heather and I talked about this earlier today, that beautiful story of the Syrophoenician woman who comes to Jesus and is begging him to cure her ill daughter. And he's like, it's a hard story because it's very hard to figure out why he's, he's brushing her aside. And of course, she sticks with it. And he finally says, you are of such faith and so strong, I'm going to grant your wish. Now, the story is harsh because it's, it, we have to do a lot of reflection and study about what's going on in the story. But the example would be, Dorothy would sit with a small group and they would read that together in Portuguese. And she would begin to ask them, how does the story make you feel? What thoughts are you getting? And this, of course, is all implementation of a theology coming out of liberation theology, which was, once the people have access to the scripture, they're going to stand up and change their lives. They're going to stand up and say, I at least have a right to the crumbs from the table. Now that's the work Dorothy was doing. It comes from an understanding of Eucharist in which we reflect, again from Vatican Council II, on the words of Jesus at the Eucharist when he says, when he takes the bread and he blesses it and he gives it and he says, this is my body given for you. And then he takes the cup and he blesses it and he says, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And then the key line, do this in memory of me. What is the this? When he says do this, what is the this? He's not saying keep doing reenactments of the Last Supper. He is not saying do reenactments of the Last Supper. He is saying take your body which has already been blessed by God and allow it to be broken apart so that those without food will be fed and what they will eat is your body. Take your blood which has already been blessed by God and let it be poured out. But listen to what he says about the pouring out of the blood. My blood poured out for forgiveness. How much blood do we human beings shed because we will not forgive? And he said, pour it out as forgiveness. Do this in memory of me. And for us to do this in memory of Jesus, we must give ourselves over completely to his mystery. It's the mystery of dying and rising. The only way we will have life, the only way our brothers and sisters on earth will have life, the only way the earth itself will continue to live is if we will give our lives up. I don't know about you, but I don't like the message. <laughs> I, I, would, I would much rather not even get out of bed in the morning. I would like to, uh, I, I'd like to be a millionaire who could, I have no worries because I'm a millionaire and I'm just going to laze around in bed and I will spend the day buying things I want and doing things I want that are fun. At least that looks appealing to me. I actually realized if I was living that way, it would get pretty boring. But um, 
when, when Jesus says, do this in memory of me, and he's really talking about 